It's good to see all of you today. We are back in the book of Romans in chapter 6 as we follow through Paul's basic explanation of what it is to be a Christian. And so uh, why don't you guys pray with me? Father, thank you for this opportunity that we get to look at your word, which has been so well preserved over the years by the work of people like Sherry Daggett. Lord, we don't take that for granted, that we have a copy of your words in our language. We thank you for that. Help us, Lord, to do it well, that we would reverence it, and that your Holy Spirit might apply it to our hearts this morning. That if there's anything in us, Lord, that's not as it should be, that you might use today, use your word to straighten it out, to make us more like you. So, Lord, here we are. We pray that you meet with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're taking on chapter 6. I'm going to take on the first 11 verses. And basically, I pulled uh, Romans 6, 4 as a, as a passage. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So that's, uh, that's kind of where we're headed into this passage, and I've titled it, Dead or Alive. Not like, not like the song, if, if you're a Bon Jovi fan, you know, I won't sing it for you, uh, but you might be familiar. As we've been going through, you can see the first three chapters of Romans talks about a diagnosis of sin, and it doesn't matter who you are, you fall short of the glory of God. We talked in chapter four about justification by faith. There's nothing we can do to make ourselves right with God because we're all sinners, we all fall short. So being justified before God is something that God does alone through Jesus Christ. Chapter five, we looked at Adam and Christ, and the first Adam, and sometimes Christ is called the last Adam, as he came and he perfected the mission that Adam kind of blew up. That was uh, the Adam bomb, if you will. But it, that didn't happen. I don't know why it came out. It did. We talked about Adam and Christ and their similarities and their differences. And today we're going to talk about sin and sanctification in chapter 6 as we go forward. Beginning in verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin, now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. So let's see if we can take this on. Grace is always a topic uh, because that's the name of our church. It's on the front of the building. Grace is truly important, but there are those that would tell you it is the most dangerous doctrine found in the scripture because grace tells you that you're justified before God, not by anything that you do, but it's something that Jesus did for you and you receive as a free gift. That we are justified before God, just as if I'd never sinned before God. So the next logical conclusion is, well, then I can do no wrong. And even if I do, 
Jesus died for my sin. So why not just sin your brains out? That's why Jesus came. So you can get the golden ticket, so you can go to the chocolate factory up in heaven, and you can just live however you want to live. There are lots of places that preach such a gospel, which is completely unscriptural. So as we look at this, I want you to know that this preaching is the most dangerous doctrine, and we've been doing it for over 2,000 years in the church. I'm going to put that on the front of the building. The question is, is grace ever a license to sin? If, if we've truly come to Christ with our heart and said, Lord, I recognize that I'm broken and I need a savior and I need forgiveness and I need grace and I need to be rebuilt from the inside out because I'm broken. I need you to be my savior and my Lord. When that happens and the Holy Spirit comes into you, does that mean that no matter what you do, that you're saved? Well, scripture says yes. Well, then why don't I just do whatever I feel like doing? Have you never had the thought in your mind of being tempted to do something and saying, well, God will forgive me? How many of you had this heretical voice come up at some point in time and say, that's okay, because God will forgive me? Yeah, I can, I can you know, the Lord, will, the, the Lord will accept me. It'll be okay. Yeah, but you might not recover from your decision. I mean, you might have some natural consequence. But there are people that believe because they've been made right with God, they're like God's kids, God's spoiled brats that can do no harm, and daddy's just going to continue to pay their bills and take care of them, and that's the way it is. And yet the scripture doesn't teach that at all. So that's what Paul is addressing. It is better to speak the truth that hurts and then heals than a falsehood that comforts and then kills. And there are lots of places that teach this sloppy agape. They teach this grace that is unmerited that you've received and it's a once and done thing, so you're free to do what you want. I w I'm here to tell you it's, it won't be that way if you truly know the Lord. If you truly have come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, a loving relationship with your heavenly father, I can tell you that your salvation is secure because it wasn't purchased by you and it's not kept by you. You can't lose it. The question is, do you really have it? And if you can just go off and do stuff, and you know Jesus was hung on a cross for that very thing, and you continue to live that way, how do you do that, having a relationship with God? And so this is the thing that we struggle with very often. Grace, it's no more a license to sin than electricity is a license to electrocute yourself. Just because God has grace and forgiveness on you doesn't mean that you should heap it upon him on the cross. And just because there's a such thing as electricity, does it give you a right to electrocute yourself? Well, I'm not sure I'd put it that way, but you probably want to avoid that. <laughs> Biblical warning. Sugar-coated preaching is dangerous to your soul. There are people that will tell you that, yes, you're, you're forgiven and it's a once and done and you can live however you want, but that's a sugar-coated gospel and doesn't show any personal responsibility. And it doesn't show anything about being changed. We're supposed to walk in newness of life. Well, if there's no newness of life, well, then what is the evidence that God's done any work in your life at all? Any of you struggle with these things? I do. Paul is really good to give us an answer. There are people that from behind the pulpit will say, Jesus obeyed the law so that you're now free to break it. We're not free from sin. We're free to sin. And all the sheep go, yay, we can do whatever we want to do. Unfortunately, it's heretical. And these are, these are false prophets that teach such a thing. First one, so Paul responding to his invisible arguer in a diatribe says, well, shall we sin? that grace may abound? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? No, that's it. If the more I sin, the better God looks, then my sin is actually making God look good, so I should continue to sin, right? And everybody said, Amen. of course not. Absolutely. Well, that's the inferred answer. That's the diatribe in the answer, right? This is what's called a hyper grace uh, or lawlessness. And it says here in Jude chapter 1, 4, it says, For there are certain men who crept in unawares who are before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, which is do whatever you feel like doing, 
and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, that very behavior belies that you don't have a relationship with God, and you couldn't possibly, because how could you love somebody and continue to treat them that way? So, it's a little like the man who went into the hospital because he thought that he had lung cancer. And of course, he's been a heavy smoker all his life. Uh, this gentleman in the picture happens to be 101 years old. He got COVID and recovered. <laughs> just, just to show you, it's, it's okay. So, but it's like somebody who went to the hospital who was given a do diagnosis of cancer and they go and they find out that they're, they're going to die and they don't have much longer to go. And then they find out, they get a different doctor and the doctor says, no, not at all. You're 101 years old. These are the things that happen. Weird things happen on your insides. You're totally fine. There's nothing wrong with you. And he goes, oh, thank God, and goes right outside and lights up. <laughs> That's what happens when you say you have a relationship with the holy God and you understand the diagnosis of your sin and yet you just go up and, and light up and fill your lungs with more cancer-causing cancer agent. That's what we do when we sin. Obedience and grace. Obedience is an expression of our love for God and it should be the spontaneous response of sinners saved by grace. Amen? Amen. Obedience is not what we do to make God love us. Obedience is what we give back to God because we're loved. It's a very different thing. And if you don't have that straight, think about it, pray about it. The Lord will help you with it. So, shall we continue with sin that may, grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? By the way, if you call yourself a Christian, then you're a zombie. You're the walking dead because you've died to yourself. It's no longer about you. It's about Christ. It's the, the life that I now live. I live by the Savior who died for me. You're, you're no longer, hey, it's all about me. It's all about my life. It's all about my priorities. You live for the Lord. And we truly are dead to ourselves and alive to the Lord because we've been baptized into his death. So this is what a church should look like. A bunch of dead people. <laughs> Not dead in your heart, but dead to your flesh. Dead to those things, those appetites that would drive you down the road that would be dishonoring to God, harmful to you, and hurtful to everyone else. There should be a progression of sanctification, that's the big theological word, of how our lives are getting cleaned up because God loves us enough to, just as we are, but he won't leave us the way we are, thank God. So this should be you, and it doesn't matter if you have a Louis Vuitton, that's a Louis Vuitton casket, casket. that's very expensive. So it doesn't matter what your outside looks like. In the inside, you should be dead. You should be dead to whatever's pulling at you, the temptations that have been programmed into you, the things that genetically have been programmed by your parents into you, the things that the devil whispers to you because of your past experiences have had a hook in you. You're dead to it. And we've been baptized into Christ's death and we identify with his death by being dead to ourselves. So, you can even get a casket that's made of basket. Uh, they have them. Uh, but whatever it is that you have, wh whatever is going on on the outside, the inside, we should all be exactly the same. We should be dead to ourselves and our flesh and alive unto the Lord. <laughs> He's only mostly dead. <laughs> He's been mostly dead all day. You see, and that becomes the problem with Christians is instead of being completely dead, we become mostly dead. We somewhat die to our flesh. We, you know, we're going to cut out the big things, you know, that, that are really, really bad. But we've got these little secret things that nobody knows about. And that's okay as long as no one finds out. Because as soon as they find out, everything goes south. There's a big difference between being mostly dead and all dead. Mostly dead is slightly alive. <laughs> Miracle Max from the Princess Bride, the Prophet Max. There are things that somehow will rise up and somehow activate in our soul, and instead of being completely dead, we're just mostly dead. And that's dishonoring to Christ, and it's certainly dishonoring to us and everyone around us. So... 
The scripture says that we have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Because we're dead to it. We're dead to it. We've made a decision. It's a decisive victory that Christ has won, and so we give it to him. And uh, we're the most grateful dead. <laughs> we're not mostly dead. Yeah, I could go on all day. <laughs> but this is teaching. Verse 3, or do you not know that as many of us that are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Was there a time in which you died? Was there a time in which you gave your life to Jesus Christ and died to your own agenda? That's the question. And that's what a Christian really does. It's not, well, you know, what, what's your religion? Well, I'm a Christian. Well, what makes you a Christian? Well, because I go to church. Really? Was there ever a time in which you died? <laughs> no. Was there ever a time you died to yourself and gave your entire life to God and said, God, you tell me to jump and I'll ask how high? That's what a Christian is. Anybody else trying to sell you something? So, have you ever seen a funeral? This was the baptism we had a couple weeks ago. And it was a funeral. Because there were five people that made a dedication to give their lives to Jesus Christ and die to themselves and live unto the Lord. We got, we got two young men right here. Raise your hand, guys. There they are. There they are. But see, it was a funeral. It was the death of self. And now we're going to identify with the resurrection of Jesus Christ and live the resurrected life. So we don't live a dead life like, oh, I can't do anything I want to do. You know, it's not an Eeyore sort of life. It's, it's where we identify with the resurrection of Jesus Christ and we actually live for God. But, you know, you can't, when a, when a jar is full, you can't fill it anymore. So something has to be emptied for you to fill up. If you want to be filled with the things of God, filled with the Spirit of God, filled with his drive and his excitement, you've got to be empty of yourself. Amen? So that was a funeral that we had. It was the identification with the crucifixion, the death and burial of Jesus Christ, and also his resurrection, which should be evident in the way that we live our lives. Not just that we identify with the death and there's just nothing in our lives, but that our lives are filled with the things of God. And that makes all the difference in the world for our lives, for his glory, and for everyone else around us, and certainly for our world. Verse 5, 4, if we have been united in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that the old man was crucified with him. The, the old man isn't maybe the, the man you're married to or your father. This is your old self. That the body of sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin. Hallelujah. For he who has died has been freed from sin. If you have truly given your life to Jesus Christ and you've died to yourself, then sin is dead to you. You're dead to me. You don't respond to it. You know, you can pinch a dead person, but nothing happens. You can scream at a dead person, nothing happens. You can do any number of things, but when you're dead, you don't respond. That's the way we are towards sin. If you've died to sin, you don't respond to it. So, because Jesus came and was crucified, and he took on all of our sin upon him, what we do is emulate and follow his death by dying to our flesh because we know where it's going to lead. And we identify with his resurrection. We know that if we died with him, we'll also be raised with him. And it's the only real proof, tangible proof that God has done a work in you is when your life has changed. If you have a sin that's got a hold of you and you can't seem to shake it, don't you start to wonder if you're really saved? Did God really do a work in me? Because I, I seem to keep having this problem, this, this sin that I fall into, and I'm decimated by it, but I continue to fall in the same area. Any of you feel that heartbreak? It doesn't have power over you anymore. I saw a video of a little dog. These people had a screen door, and they always had the screen in, 
and the little dog was barking and you know, and he would go right up to the screen door and bark and bark and bark, and the guy took the screen out. <laughs> so the dog could actually just step over a little teeny little threshold and he'd be outside. But he was so conditioned with that screen there that he would go up to the screen and bark and bark and bark, and the owner would go outside and call him out. He wouldn't come out until he opened the door. Then he can come out. <laughs> he'd put him back in. He'd call him out, and he would not go through that opening because he had been so conditioned by that screen that I can't go through there. But he could. Sin lies to you and tells you the same thing. You have to do what it says because you're still a slave to sin. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you have the power to say no to sin, and it doesn't rule you. You're not a slave anymore. That's the beauty of what it is to be a Christian. So whatever difficulty it is that you have, stop fighting in physical terms and come to the Lord and learn how to fight a spiritual battle because that's where the fun is. And I say fun because it's an adventure. For God to win a new part of your life and for you to be free from the thing that's got a hook in you. By the way, there's no hook in you. There's a screen door that's invisible. It's not there anymore. It's gone. You don't need to obey the sinful desires of your body and your mind anymore if you know Jesus Christ. Today might be the first day for you to live free of whatever bondage it is that you think you're in because you're really not. Jesus freed you if you're his but you have to lay hold of it. So, verse 8. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. And if it was that way for him in a human body, God being poured into human flesh, isn't that the same for you and I? I died to sin once when I committed my life to Jesus Christ. And the life that I now live, I'm going to live for the Son of God who died for me. That's how we live. So how do you continue to live in sin that grace might be continued to be poured out on you? It's, it's really bad. It's stinking thinking, right? And yet, if you're not careful, there are people on the TV and there are people around you that actually subscribe to this. But everything that the Bible teaches goes completely against it. So, we live with him because he is alive. John 11:25 25 to 26, Jesus said, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die physically, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And he asked her, do you believe this? This was Martha he was speaking to at the death of Lazarus because Lazarus was dead and they were weeping. And Jesus had a plan, but they didn't get it. And he goes, I'm the resurrection and the life. He believes in me, though, though he die, you live. Do you believe that? If you truly believe that, then we bear the marks of the Savior on our lives, in our speech, in what we do, and the things we set our affections on. His fingerprints are all over us because we're in a love relationship with our Heavenly Father. There should be love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, meekness, faithfulness, and self-control ebbing out of our pores and everything that we do. You know what stops that? when we think the screen door is still in there and we don't have the ability to cross over. But Jesus already did it for us. We just need to lay hold of it. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our job is to reckon, and it's not the southern term, Y'all going to be at church tomorrow? I reckon. It's not, it's not that reckon. It's actually an accounting term. It means to consider into an account and put it on a certain side. You, you justify it, if you will. So that's what we do. We, we account our sinful nature as dead. Does it mean that it doesn't come up and try to take hold of you again? No. 
I mean, sometimes prisoners make a lot of ruckus, right? Inside their prison walls, you know, hey! The flesh will do that too. You know, he tends to get quiet though and shriveled up if you don't feed him. But if you open up the bars, he'll ruin your life because the thing that you give yourself is the thing that is the master of you. And we're gonna get into that next week. But who's your master? Jesus Christ, he's our master. John 12, verses 23 to 25 says this, Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come that the son of man should be glorified. By the way, that's Jesus's term for being crucified. Is that how we feel? We should. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies... It produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And by the, word that, by the way, that word hate is not an emotional word. It means to despise. It means to consider less than. It means to choose not that thing. That's what it means to hate in the scriptural terms. We're so accustomed to... Uh, modern psychology and emotions and how do you feel? We, we read hate, uh, com completely different. So Jesus says, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He's saying that's the case with you and me. If we're willing to die to ourselves, if we're willing to lay our lives down and let the Lord take over our lives, there's gonna be fruit in our lives that are gonna be eternal things that are important. But if we don't, then you just abide alone. And I'll tell you, that's a miserable existence. To be fruitless, it, it's like we had a pear tree in front of our house that never bore any pears. What the heck is the purpose of that thing? <laughs> I got to rake the leaves. I got to, you know, trim the, the branches. One of the branches fell off on a car. I mean, come on, what, what are you doing here? There's no fruit. What do you, what's a fruitless tree for? It's for ornamation. It's to ornate and make it make look pretty. <laughs> I got no use for fruitless trees. And I don't want to be one of those fruitless trees. Just being a burden on people? Nah. Jesus says we fall to the ground and die, and then there's fruit that's born. John 16, 22 says, Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. Because we die like Christ, we live with Christ. And at that point, no one can take your joy from you and there's going to be no more sorrow, no more tears, and the Lord's going to take it all. The scripture says that he takes all of our tears and he keeps them in a bottle. It's a nice poetic way of saying God knows every single pain and difficulty you have had in your life and ever will. And he takes the care to collect it, as it were, and put it in a bottle. What a beautiful explanation of God's love for us. Psalm 126.5 says, those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. The principle is, if you are willing to sacrifice now, you will be blessed later. Any of you who save money know that this is the case. Any of you that have a budget understand that this is the case. When you sacrifice and you don't buy everything that you feel like, like, oh, it's on Amazon, it's on sale. But you have a budget and you regulate yourself and you put that money aside for the various things that are needed, including the future. Those things that you, when you're working, you know that those things will mean something in the future. Those who sow in tears will reap in joy. Those of you who serve the Lord and have been involved in any kind of ministry know that this is true. Whenever you give yourself over, I'll tell you what, you open yourself up for pain, rejection, all sorts of things. But what you do is you become a partaker in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, this hidden manna, this wonderful life of serving and pleasing God. It's better than anything this world has to offer. And if you know it, it can become addictive just like other things. In Acts 20, verse 22 to 24 says this. This is Paul speaking to the Ephesian elders and he's saying goodbye to them. He's had a long ministry with them and he's saying goodbye to them. 
and he's sorrowful to leave them. Anytime you leave people that you love, it's always difficult. Um, you know, like when you change where you're living or you, you move out of state or we have a number of people that are doing that. It's always difficult to reestablish relationships. And here's Paul leaving and he's going out to where God's called him to go, saying goodbye to the Ephesian elders. He's warning them about the wolves that are going to come in after he leaves because he's kind of the chief shepherd with, you know, with the baseball bat ready to knock them down and he's leaving. He says this, and see now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me. Nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to f testify to the gospel of the grace of God. He goes, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know that the Lord's confirmed in my heart it's going to be trouble, distress, and chains for me. None of these things moves me. He has reckoned himself dead to sin and alive unto God. He has accounted for that and he's made up his mind. Boys and girls, we really have a problem with sin because we don't make up our mind and we don't believe the truth. But when we do, God comes in and he's able to do so much with our lives. I'm gonna tell you an interesting story as I close about Barak and Sisera. In the, in the book of Judges in chapter four, Deborah comes on the scene. <laughs> There's a succession of some judges who are these people who just kind of pop up and they take charge and they give leadership for a while. And then when that person falls off the map or dies, everything goes, you know, everyone does what's right in their own eyes again. And there's a woman, Deborah, who rises up and she's a prophetess. And during this time, Israel's being ransacked by um, Jabin, who's this ruler of the Canaanites, and just act absolutely decimating all these people. Well, there's a family of the Kenites, Jael, who moves away from the central populace because she wants to be left alone with her husband and her family and moves away from what's going on. Now, Jabin has Sisera as a, as a general, and he says, listen, we're going we're gonna to knock these guys out. They have 900 iron chariots, and they're going to move in and just level Israel. And so Deborah tells Barak, this general on Jerusalem side, hey, listen, you know what's going on? The Lord said that he's going to give you victory. You know this, right? And he goes, yeah. <laughs> and she goes, well, I'm going to give you the Jersey version. Go get him. And he goes, well, if you go with me, And she goes, okay, I'll go with you, but you know that a woman's going to get the glory instead of you. And he goes, uh, okay. And so he gathers all the people, and Deborah says, what you need to do is go up the mountain. Go just go up the mountain like there's nothing going on. And he takes all these troops, and he goes up the mountain. Well, Jabin hears about it, and so does his general. And so they decide they're going to kick down in the lowlands. Doesn't seem like there's anything going on. And while that's happening, Deborah gets word from God, and Deborah says, go get them. Because now they're in a place where their chariots don't work. And so they all come flying down from the hill, and they start, they start taking, they slaughter every single person, except for Sisera. Sisera runs for his life, and he finds some, somebody's outpost in the middle of nowhere. It's J.L.'s home. And J.L. sees him coming and knows he's the oppressor, knows he's the enemy, knows exactly who it is. And she says, listen, come in here. I'll take care of you. She opens up her tent. He comes in and he's scared. He's the only one to survive. The general of the Canaanites. She says, come on in, listen, have a seat, relax. Gets him a blanket throws it around him. He goes, listen, I'm really thirsty. Could you get me some, some water to drink? She pours him some milk. Like buttermilk. Thick. 
knowing he was lactose intolerant, <laughs> pours, him, pours him some milk, and he drinks this warm milk, because they're in the desert, there's no refrigeration. This warm milk. Warm milk in a blanket. What's that mean to you? Nighty night. <laughs> she knows this. She brings him in, gets him comfortable, gives him some drink, and then she does this unthinkable thing. She takes a tent peg, puts it on his temple, drives it right through his head, right into the ground. Well, it doesn't take long for Israel's army to come and track him down. And they come to jail's tent, and she goes, come on in, come on in. I got him right here. He's right here. I'll show you. Your man's in here. And I'm sure that they're, they're ready to, you know, he's the general, so he knows what he's doing. But there he is, pinned to the floor with the tent peg. And you say, Pastor Dave, what does that have anything to do <laughs> with chapter 6 of Romans? <laughs> the enemy of Israel is the enemy of you. If sin comes knocking on your door, don't think that you're unable to fight the battle, because you can. You take the sinful problem that you think has reign over you, and you stick a peg through its head and pin it to the ground. And that's what you do to temptation. That's what you do to your enemy, because Jesus Christ has given you power over sin. You are no longer a slave. They were no longer slaves of the Canaanites. You are no longer a slave to your sin. Your sin has been crucified, was hung on the cross with Jesus Christ. You need to claim that victory and pick up a hammer and run that tent peg through the head of whatever it is that's coming upon you to make you believe you're a slave because you're not. I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine waking up and finding some young lass holding a sharp tent peg to your temple. You can do that to whatever it is, whatever besetting sin, whatever thing it is that you think you have to do. You don't. Because Jesus died, you died with him, you'll be raised with him, and sin no longer reigns in your mortal body. Amen? Amen.